I am going to be talking about uh, IoT. Uh, the answer to all your problems, it's a bold statement. It's obviously a very exaggerated statement. It's not going to solve all your problems, but it needed a tagline and that's it. Uh, so starting off with an introduction to Ninet. Uh, so who are we? Probably unless you're in North Yorkshire, so unless you're Tim, you've probably never heard of us before. <coughs> Uh, so we are actually owned by North Yorkshire Council. We're one of many companies that they own, including Berito, who are on our stand today, who do data protection services. Uh, we are, however, a private sector company. We are run as a private sector company. We have private sector staff, and we are run to make a profit. The only difference is when we make that profit, it goes back into the council and obviously pays for things like social care. Um, our core business is connectivity services. Thankfully for you, I'm not going to talk about that today. Obviously, schools broadband have already spoken about broadband this morning, uh, so you don't want to hear too much about it again. Uh, but we provide to the public sector in North Yorkshire, we provide to the NHS, uh, over 200 schools, blue light services, we provide to fire and rescue. Um, we also have a government funded full fibre network, and we provide free public Wi Fi. So if you go into any of the 20 largest towns in North Yorkshire and go onto public Wi Fi, that was uh, delivered and managed by Ninet. Uh, in addition to that, we have an Internet of Things network, which is a good thing. Otherwise, this presentation would be pointless. Um, we have connectivity products onto 17 business, 16 business parks. So we are now pushing out into the private sector. Uh, we have some cybersecurity training products, which are provided by our partners, Boxdish. And there's a booklet on our stand if you're interested. And we also do some IP telephony. So first of all, a bit about me. I don't think you can go wrong in a techie presentation with a picture of a BBC Micro. Um, so this is where my IT life started. Uh, my dad worked in IT for the army, and so I very much got into computing at an early age. Um, following on from that, this is where my networking life started. Uh, this is literally the 56K modem I had. It is on eBay. I may buy it. Um, but that's where I started. Uh, so I've been a chief executive for coming up to two years now, but actually I started off at Nine as a techie. I was a network engineer going up to network manager before I became who I am now. So I like to think that gives me a really good combination of actually understanding how the things work that we're trying to sell. Um, I just thought this was quite a good picture. So that was my networking career then. This is my networking career now. This is one of our core exchanges. Uh, this is actually in North Allerton. Uh, so we've got lots of full fiber network in there at the bottom. We've got our core networking kit at the top. Um, and it's a real spaghetti. So I think it's also kind of reassuring for you guys that it's not just your cabinets that are a bit of a mess. Ours are also a bit of a mess. So in terms of our core fiber network, um, we have 225 kilometers of fiber. Uh, we have some of our fiber spines, 288 core fiber, uh, which means in total we have about 64,000 kilometers of fiber, which I looked last night. Uh, not that I did this last night, is enough to go around the earth one and a half times. So that's a lot of fiber. Um, we actually are slightly different from what Dave was talking about this morning. We don't use PON uh, because of the fact that we're providing to public sector and schools. We just have a single fiber. So we don't use any splitters or anything like that. It just means it's much more future proof for us because we're not providing it to residential. Um, thankfully for you, like I said, I'm not going to be talking about broadband. That's it. Forget about it. Done. Uh, so what is IoT? Um, IoT is everywhere. So it can be in your car. If you've got a car that's connected to the internet, then that is the internet of things. It could be in your smart light bulbs, your smart uh, heating. And if you grew up at the same time, time as me, then you probably all wanted an internet fridge, even though we never really knew why. But it was meant to be the thing, and it will tell you when your shopping needed to be refilled and everything like that. I don't, I'm guessing nobody in here has an internet fridge. No? Good. Nothing to be jealous of. Perfect. So first of all, I want to talk about the I and IoT, which is, of course, the internet. So uh, for us, IoT, we have a fixed uh, network, a LoRaWAN network across North Yorkshire. This is one of our masts. Um, I just thought, because this is a bit of a techie audience, you might actually like to see kind of some of the back end of how this works, and then we'll move into the actual use cases for it. Uh, so it is a long range, low bandwidth network. Uh, low bandwidth means that you know generally the packets are a few K the packet will continue, contain all the necessary stuff and then a few readings. So if you look at some of the sensors we've got with us today, the water rate sensor is literally just giving a zero if there's no leak and a one if there is a leak. It's really low data, but that means that you can go much longer range. Um, 
we have a variety of different gateways. So on the left, you've got a mass-based gateway. That gateway is actually the one that is on top of that mast there. So that's 20 meter mast. Um, we've got some internal gateways, which we've got on our stand and is actually powering our LoRaWAN network we've got running today. Uh, we've got some green columns, which are out in the dale. So these are actually not connected to the mains or anything. They have a solar panel, uh, wind turbine, and 4G backhaul. Um, so the idea of them is that we get as close to the edge of the 4G network as possible, and then we reproduce it with LoRaWAN to try and get really into the depths of the Yorkshire Dales. We have a satellite-based solution. Uh, so the satellites make a pass four times a day. It's obviously not good for something like, is the gate open or closed? Because you'll find out that actually, yes, the gate was open yesterday. But it is good for if you're doing people counting or traffic counting. If you want to see how many people are entering via each entrance, then actually the liveness of the data isn't important. Uh, we've also got gateways on North Yorkshire's weather stations and uh, lots of North Yorkshire's lampposts. Uh, so all of that together results in this network here. All of the green pluses are gateways. The pink area is coverage and the red dots. Basically what we've done is we've given a test device to all of the highways people. And so as the highways people are driving out on North Yorkshire's roads, it therefore gives us a good idea about where we actually have coverage. The next step is to put it out with bin lorries because bin lorries obviously go to every premises in North Yorkshire to really reinforce it. So you can see the main gaps that we've got are the dales where nobody's living, but we're trying to infill with um, green columns and then little patches of the moors up here. Uh, I thought this slide is quite an interesting one. Um, unfortunately, we're not in North Yorkshire, although nor is this completely. So this is South Cave, just near Hull. Uh, that left-hand end of the line is Beckwith Shore, which is just outside of Harrogate, where we're based. Uh, and so you can see there, this was actually a packet that I saw in our system, which had gone 43.54 miles. So that gives you an idea of the range of LoRaWAN. Obviously, that's upper mast, so it's probably a 20-meter mast. But it goes to show that actually when it's out in fresh air, it got, has an absolutely fantastic range. So in terms of the type of sensors that you can do, I'm not going to go through this. Um, the slides will get sent out, so you'll be able to see all the different kind of sensors. But you can see lots of sensors. And actually, I would have said pretty much every day that a new sensor, we've just been back from the Things Conference, where it's, you know, it's even more people are bringing out even more things. And actually, sensors now are going more towards just something to reproduce it out onto the network. So you know, it's taking something else that you already have and making it work. Uh, this is our border sensor that we've got today, which is behind you with the green light on. Uh, so in terms of the sensor that we've got here, we've got an air quality sensor, we've got a door sensor. I'll go through most of these. Um, we were meant to have a power sensor, but unfortunately it wasn't in the box. Uh, a tracker, we've got the internal gateway, we've got the light at the bottom, which I'll come back to, water sensor and a gate sensor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through some of the use cases that we might have uh, to have a look at the problems that you have and how we can solve it. Because I think the really important thing from our point of view is that actually the point of IoT is to make your life easier and ideally to make your life cheaper. Nobody's going to put a gate sensor if you didn't care whether the gate was open or closed in the first place. But if you have a manual process that you're doing right now, then sensors are a really good opportunity there. So first opportunity here, um, pictures are difficult in a world where you care about copyright. So unfortunately, I think this is probably more of an American school, but there's some bored school kids um, it's not because the teaching's poor, it's because the air quality is poor. So air quality is definitely much more of a focus now, ever since COVID, scarlet fever, there's a lot more of a push in public health in terms of having improved air quality. And there are also some scientific case studies around the importance of air quality and education. Um, so poor air quality will lead to illness, it will also lead to a lack of concentration. Uh, there are some schools in Scotland which have put in air quality just because they are outstanding schools and they care so much about their grades. They want to do everything possible to ensure that their students have the best learning environment. I'm not sure that most schools are there yet because I think, you know, a lot of schools are struggling to put meals on the table. Never mind, make the best learning environment. But it, you still have the point that actually kids being off sick isn't helpful. It goes around and actually the solution to these problems isn't screens, it's not masks, it's just better air quality. So the solution is to monitor the air quality of the classroom, giving staff the knowledge of when ventilation needs to be improved by opening windows. One thing that's really important with our solution is it's about doing something now. It's not about knowing that the air quality is bad in that classroom yesterday, it's about fixing the air quality now. I can't see my next slide, so sometimes I'm going on and it's a little bit of a journey for both of us. No, we're good. 
Okay, so this is the sensor. Uh, it is top right on our board over there. It's a very simple sensor. There are some out there which have numbers on which tells you their quality. Actually, we don't believe that's a good idea. We want this to be inconspicuous. The teacher shouldn't be looking at this sensor. If the teacher is looking at this sensor, then we fail because teachers don't understand what parts per million means and they shouldn't need to understand it. In addition, not all schools are the best schools in the world. So we want a sensor that looks like a light switch or something like that. We don't want a sensor that's going to get some interesting and get knocked off the wall. They're not ridiculously expensive, but on the other hand, we don't want them breaking. So in terms of the ranges, uh, this is where we pitch it. This is based on information from our public health colleagues in the council. So ideally you are looking for less than 800 parts per million. Between 800 and 1500 is an amber and over 1500 is a red. The way that our system works, you'll have seen our green light. It's a very bright green light. Um, and basically that light is actually tied to the air quality sensor. So we are broadcasting a gateway today. The two of them are chatting to each other. And if the air quality in here was to get worse, then it would go amber, it would get red. I think probably when I arrived this morning, I was expecting to see a red by now, but actually the venue has shockingly good air conditioning. Um, and therefore it's, in, it's really quite good. Um, it's around 597 last time I checked. So we are very much in the green. 400 is basically the natural environment. So we're only just above the natural environment, given how many people are in the room. I think that's great. And that's why, you know, it's actually really important for conferences because I went to a conference a couple of years ago and basically everybody who's got COVID who went there because you're all in a confined space. But being in a confined space with good ventilation, which can be in the form of mechanical ventilation, is just as good. So it all gets delivered onto an air quality dashboard. Again, this is all about trying to keep things simple. Um, so it's a number, it's got humidity, it's got temperature, but actually the most important thing, there is just a circle. The dashboard has changed slightly since then because 8% of the male population are colorblind. Um, so it's now got a smiley face, a neutral face, an unhappy face. But again, it's just to try and make things nice and easy. Um, and again, that's the idea with the light as well. It's to try and say to people, if, if, let's say you're in a primary school. I've got two primary school age kids. I know that if they were tasked for the day with being chief window opener, they would probably tell me that that was the highlight of their day on the way home from school. And that's the thing. It's about trying to involve the kids. It's about trying to say to the kids, look, here's a light. If this light goes amber, go and open the window. It shouldn't be the teacher's job. The teacher shouldn't be looking at this. The teacher shouldn't be looking at the emails that we send. It should just be really simple. Look at the light and do something about it. We do have historical data because there are things. So recently there was a fund for HEPA filters within primary schools, which was to improve um, the filtration. So we have one, which is this one here, upper key stage two at this primary school. It actually only has a skylight. It doesn't have any normal windows. That means that anytime it's raining, they can't open the window. I've seen that get up to three and a half thousand on a bad day. So they wanted this system because it means that actually they can then use the data that comes out of this to justify to the government, to justify to their governors, to whoever it matters that they need to do something about that because three and a half thousand isn't okay. Four or four and a half thousand, I can't remember exactly, is the maximum that HSE suggests in a workplace is safe. So, you know, you've got kids there who aren't far off the maximum. Um, so again, it's all about simplicity, you know, nothing too complicated. The other thing that it does notice though is temperatures. You can see here down the prefabs at 21.9 degrees, the prefabs are heated seven days a week to 22 degrees. That's an absolute waste of money. Um, if they put some sort of sensor in there, then they can drop that and they would probably make instant savings that would actually pay for this whole platform for a year if they just stopped heating the school when people weren't there. Next up, an even simpler problem, open gates. Um, any high schools in particular will probably have multiple ways in and out the building and they have gates on them. It's really important to make sure that gate is shut and it's really important to make sure that the gate is shut at the end of the day. You may also have a public footpath which runs through your school. So making sure that the gate is closed. So what we have is we have sensors which will monitor the state of the gates. It will alert if it's opened. Um, it won't alert if it's closed, but you can also, you know, somebody can log on at the end of the day and just make sure that everything looks good. Um, the gate one is the bottom left on our stand, if you're interested. This one's a bit more of a specialist one. We do have a trial going into Tim's school soon. Um, so this is for schools which are using biomass. Um, so we use silo sensor to see how full the silo is. It means that it's no longer up to manual people to check. 
We're doing something similar with uh, the highways team in North Yorkshire because at the moment, the way that they check the grip pile is they look on the ground and they've got a rough idea that the closer that the grip pile is to you, the more grip there is. That's not ideal. You're having to drive around. It's much better actually to put a sensor. You can log on and you can see where it is. We've also seen the same thing with oil tank monitoring in much more rural areas that at the moment somebody needs to have a look into the oil tank and see how much is there. That one's quite an easy one to see the saving off because actually if you know how much is in it and you can kind of plot it and you can graph it on a yearly basis, you can probably see when you need to order. And for some of these things, especially with oil, oil is cheaper in the summer than it is in the winter. So you can probably try and figure out when you could buy your oil cheaper. Or you could even look, you know, if you've got multiple primary schools, you can try and tie these orders together to get one much bigger order. I'm spoiling all of this. That's okay. So uh, next one up is to do with doors. So doors, uh, comms cabinets. I'm assured by Chantel, who's over on our stand, our sales manager, that some of you do have radioactive stuff. I don't remember radioactive stuff at school. I went to school in the Northeast, so it might be that we didn't get trusted. Uh, so problem. Um, I work for an ISP. We all know about the cable fairies. Um, we've all had the fault come in to say that the primary school stopped working and we'll go out, we'll find the, put the cables in the wrong port and the school is adamant they have not been in the cabinet, it's definitely not been in the cabinet, it was definitely the cable fairies. So a really easy answer to that is you can just put a, a monitor on it. We have 12 street cabs in some of our business parks and actually we've got the monitors in them. It means that it just sends an email as soon as it's been opened. If you're a trust who's managing say 10 primary schools, put a cheap monitor on each of the cabinets and it will fire off an email to you to say the cabinet's been opened. Chances are you weren't expecting it, at which point you can then ask the teacher to step away, teach and leave IT to you. Uh, final one is much more, might be the final one. Hopefully not, I'm only 17 minutes in. Um, it's a much more generic one. It's power related. Uh, so a smart plug on the left, it doesn't have to be a smart plug. If it's a much higher power draw, it can actually be done wired in. Um, so kilns, uh, microwaves, photocopiers, those kind of things. Uh, approximately 45% of schools' electricity use is consumed out of school hours. Uh, so the solution is a dashboard that measures how much electricity is being used with the ability to turn appliances off and on remotely from a dashboard. Some of this as well, it will almost be a one-off, but actually in the example of the kilns, um, if they need to be checked that they're on or off at the end of the night, then somebody can just log on and make sure that it's there. Or you can set up a routine to say at five o'clock every day, check whether the kiln is on and if it is, switch it off. Um, there is a lot of that, if this, then that, with an IoT. Um, so one of the things which is very much outside of this that you could do is if you had an electricity meter and a uh, master circuit breaker, then actually you can say, when we've used over a certain amount of electricity, cut it off. You wouldn't necessarily want to do it, but you know it, it gives you an idea that you can very much link together observing something and changing something. Uh, everything needs a dashboard because otherwise what you're going to do with it. So this is the dashboard that we work with. Uh, you basically create a digital twin of your school um, and you can then assign the sensors within it. So this is our non-air quality dashboard. This is for all the other sensors. So we've got a CO2 sensor here just because we were playing. We've got a water leak sensor, a door sensor, and way up here is a gate sensor. Um, it delivers it all here. You can see that the rooms are green, amber, red, depending on what the status is. Um, you, we also, you've also then, if you zoom out, which I can't because this is just a picture, um, you can then see a wider map. And so, for example, we've got a tracker. That tracker, if I log onto the platform right now, will show that it is in Leeds where we are because it's got a GPS chip in it. So if you do have anything that you want to track around the school, it will track with more accuracy on the school grounds because as long as it's within the GPS range, it will show you within the rooms, but also it will show you further afield. Um, it could also be useful for things like, um, I was talking to a scout leader recently who they were saying actually when they're off doing scout trips in the river malls or something like that, then it's a good kind of backup system. It does have uh, an emergency button on it as well. So it's got a panic button as well as a GPS. It won't do anything. So if you all get really tempted to press the blue flashing light like Karen did, it's not actually going to do anything. Yeah, so I mean, that's a relatively big tracker, really. You can get trackers which are literally stickers and stick on the back of it. 
you're always having to make a decision between whether it's a good investment or not. Yeah, yeah. You know, I had the same discussion with the highways team because they're losing signs all the time. Yeah. The sign isn't worth the tracker. No. But an iPad probably yeah. is worth the tracker. Right. 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 <laughs> Spend a bit of time on it. <laughs> okay, um, the big one which I know everybody's having a problem with is vape sensors. Um, I particularly like the bottom picture. Chantel got this. It's from the Daily Mail. <laughs> and uh, apparently, the you can see it's from the Daily Mail based on the woman. Um, and she looks very angry. She was angry because her child wasn't allowed to vape. Uh, he's about 14. Um, and he needs to vape because he's trying to give up cigarettes. So it's, it's, it's a wonderful world we live in. Um, so we have a vape sensor. Um, we didn't get it in time. It's an American vape sensor, so it needs reprogramming to um, EU LoRaWAN standards, which is why instead we have a cardboard cutout of it, if you haven't noticed. Uh, it is a vape sensor and a sound anomaly detector. It is an American sensor, so if you do have any gun problem in your school, it's going to be fantastic. It's going to see the gunshots. Thankfully, we don't really have that issue, but it can also detect other stuff. It detects shouting. It detects bullying so the things that go with bullying as well as uh, vaping of THC nicotine and other vaping products it has um, a system built into it so if a child tries to go too close to it then it will alert because otherwise the children are probably just going to rip this off the wall um, it, so it empowers you to gain control of access where you can't put a camera on a microphone obviously toilets are always the big problem you can't put the camera into the toilets but actually you can put this each sensor does a 12 foot by 12 foot area so it's quite a big area um, it can be done using PoE, but obviously not every toilet has PoE in it. It can also be powered using an AC-DC adapter. So if you've got some fused mains within the room, which you probably do if you've got lighting, then you could just take a spur off and then get it into the sensor. So uh, in terms of what do you need to do this in your own school, uh, you need sensors, gateways, network server, and then a dashboard to bring it onto. So the sensors obviously are at the back. There are probably about 900 sensors on the market right now. There's a lot of duplication. You know, there's probably eight different air quality sensors. There's probably about 20 different trackers. Um, but, you know, th th there's plenty out there. And I think pretty much every idea that you've had of what you could do in track is there. We always say that it's a mixed I don't want to say selling because this isn't a selling presentation. I don't want this to be a selling presentation, but it's a mixed sell when we go out there because actually sometimes you're selling air quality, but sometimes you're selling a dream. And the dream is, look, you go away, you think about the problems that you have and you work out how this technology can fix it. Because actually we don't know. We don't run a school. You know, we, we deal with lots of schools and we've got an idea what it looks like, but we don't know what your problems are. And so we can't tell you what the solution is, but you can. So you can go away, you can have a look. You might identify a sensor that you need. They all go back to a gateway. So we have external gateways. We can also put internal gateways. Um, primary schools, we generally expect that the external gateways would be fine. Secondary schools, maybe not. If you've got a really big school, then you might end up that actually some of your classrooms are kind of too much in the middle of the room. But as we saw before, 41 miles out of one gateway. So if we put one gateway within the school, it should be absolutely fine. Um, all of that gets delivered back onto a network server, which is the bit you don't really need to see. And then the dashboard is the bit you're really focused on. The great thing about the dashboard, which I showed before, is it's completely sensor agnostic because it's just based on where you are. So you can deliver all of your sensors onto this one platform. You might have a classroom which has got a comms cabinet, so it's got a door sensor in it. It's also got an air quality sensor in it. And it's also got a water leak detection. Um, I don't think I've got a slide about water leak detection, so I will just take a quick tangent. Um, so. Our water leak detection actually only just made it here. It was in my comms room as of yesterday because it's, the comms room has no roof. Um, so we wanted to make sure that our comms room wasn't getting wet. There's two different kinds. That one is just using two little metal probes. They're attached to the floor. As soon as it's wet, then obviously it will short between it, and that will therefore send an alert. What you can also get is you can get a mat. So the mat basically is attached either underneath or, be or below. And as soon as that senses any water on the mat, it will send off an alert. So what we're going to do with that is actually the problem is generally, in my experience, as soon as the floor is wet, it's too late. You know, the leak is too big, especially because most leaks are probably coming down and not up. Our leak was directly above our comms cabinet. So by the time that the floor was wet enough to set off the detector, 
the comms cabinet would be soaking. So actually what you want really is a mat above the comms cabinet that will therefore show you that the comms cabinet is about to get wet. Uh, so you can do both of those. The benefit of the mat is it can be as big or as small as you can like. It all kind of fits together. Because again, it's all based on really simple technologies. You know, the, the, the technology here is if you short two things together, then it's going to send an alert and water is a great conductor. Uh, so uh, what's stopping you from doing it? It needs minimal investment. You've got no requirement for complex infrastructure. One of the things that I actually do think is really good about it, you don't really have to put this on your network. You could have a 4G based um, gateway, which is how we're running today, or you could put the gateway in your network, but actually all you then have to do, put the gateway into your DMZ, and then all of the other sensors are going to be connected to the gateway, so you're not continually making these holes in the smooth wall. You're not having to continually add devices onto your guest Wi-Fi. My guess is that your Wi-Fi's are probably already full with students' devices, and the last thing that you want is another device. Even a low-power device is still taking up an IP reservation, and it's still taking up data space. It's available to all schools. I mean, it's available to everybody. You can put it at home if you like. Um, I think probably at least some of us are going to have smart homes because we're those kind of people. Um, I don't have LoRaWAN at home, but I do have plenty of other IoT stuff, much to my wife's hatred. Um, it's cost-efficient sensors with long lives. Not only does the sense have a long life, so does the battery. If you're looking at things like the air quality sensor, the battery on that's probably going to last about three years. Um, the leak sensor even more so, because what that does is it sends a message every hour just to say what its state is. But actually, it's only half awake, so it's always checking whether there's a leak or not, but it's not talking to the gateway. It only talks to the gateway when it detects a leak. And by doing that, the batteries last even longer. So they've all got standard batteries in. Um, the wireless um, leak detector, that's got small one and a half volt batteries and that will still last over a year. Um, bring your own device. Is this, yeah, I've got another slide on that, so that's fine. Um, it's managed from one pane of glass, that's what I was saying before, you know, having a dashboard which shows everything in one place is really important. You don't have the time to be logging into 14 different dashboards. So being able to log in and see what the state is of everything in that classroom is important. And it's easy to deploy. Every single sensor on our stand is stuck on using command strips. Every air quality sensor that we deploy, we stick it using command strips to the wall because they're not heavy, so why bother messing around? As soon as you start drilling into the wall, you've got your asbestos concerns. So just command strip it on. You know, it's an easy life, really. So they're very easy to deploy. We send out all of our sensors pre-joined to the network and pre-tested. So when we do this, you know, they go out, they get stuck to the wall, and then they'll just literally jump out onto our system. So today I've done absolutely nothing with any of those sensors here. They just connected and worked. So bring your own device. I have used bring your own device because I know you're all used to it. It's, you know, it is very much a school's term. So the idea here is actually if you want to do everything, which I know a lot of you do, you can do, you know, buy your sensors, bring them along. If you want to deal with us, great. Um, and actually what we can do is then we will just join it onto our network, put it onto the dashboard, and you can then do whatever you want. So obviously there's a small monthly fee, nothing in life's free. Um, but the idea there is actually you can be in control of your own destiny. You can go out, you can buy sensors, we'll tell you where to buy the sensors from, and you can choose the sensors that work for you. We don't make any money on sensors. It's not what we do. It's not what we're interested in. So, you know, we don't care where you buy the sensors. We do kind of care what sensors you buy because some sensors are good and some sensors aren't. But actually, if you want to, you can go out, you can figure out your problems, buy your sensors, let us know the relevant details, and we'll then join them onto the network, and it will then automatically come into your environment so you can see it on your dashboard. So that helps you solve the issues with the data you need at the pace that you want because you don't have to do it at our pace. That is my last slide. Um, I do talk fast, and so it's always slower when I practice it at home. Um, however, I think given that we are at the end of the day, probably trying to finish early isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, but any questions? Do you have any kind of CCTV time? So you can see there's an error at the bottom of the sensor, click, take it to the nearest camera so you can visually verify or anything like that? So a lot of things can plug in. So the vape sensor can plug into a VMS, and it can kind of connect together, and therefore it can alarm so if you do have a camera outside a the toilet then the vape sensor can create the alarm which means that you'll then start to record on the toilet um the network's not been made i know i was going to go over it really quickly um no no cameras in toilets let's let's say that um 
it then it was not really made for, for actual CCTV. You can do motion detection because motion is a really nice, simple packet. But in terms of the camera itself, you're better off just with the standard camera on Wi Fi. Um, just because it, it, you know it's not really the right environment. We're talking, I mean, most of the packets that get sent probably are sub 10 kilobytes. Um, so if you were to start to do image, it would probably be like a camera phone from the late 90s. Yeah, do you have an idea that you can give a speech to the people watch online as regards to pricing? For could you give an example of sort of like um, a low cost device, mid range, high range, and um, what, what it will cost to actually get yourself up and running? Yes, so I did have some stuff in, but I was trying to make sure that it wasn't too much itself. So in terms of the sensors themselves, they are an absolute real range. So if you look at something like the uh, door window internal sensor, that's probably about twenty pounds. If you look at the gate sensor, that's about two, three hundred pounds. The main reason is the gate sensor IP sixty seven. Also, if you look at the internal, you'll probably be able to get your magnets about that close to each other. Whereas your gate really needs to work out to here because your gates aren't necessarily going to be that closely lined. You don't want to be saying it's open when it's not. Um, air quality, maybe about 150. So it's a it's real variety. But in terms of the, the more common sensors, so you know your water leak sensor, your door sensor, the things that actually could give you a really easy and quick reward, they're probably around 20 pounds each. Um, in terms of kind of costs to run it on the network, it's all volume based, and that's the thing. You know, it, it, if you want one sensor, it's you know it's not going to be the cheapest thing in the world. But if you want 100 sensors, then obviously that's where it's come in, and that's where when we work with council, that's what they're doing. So the council's got I think about 300 of these sensors in North Allerton. So if you park in North Allerton, you'll see the little disc on the ground, and that is smart parking. Um, it, it's much more cost effective when you've got 300 of them. Have they done one than the project we've never got off the ground? I do have one last thing to say, given that we've only got about eight currently, so you've got really good odds. We are giving away two Lego models, uh, so if you want to, come to our stand. Uh, there's a post-it note, just write your name, school and email address, fold it in half, chuck it in the fishbowl, uh, and you may win yourself some Lego, because who doesn't like Lego? <laughs> Thank you very much, Alistair. Thank you. Thank you.